if you have mostly physical background, or M, if you have mostly mathematical background. Okay. And of course, I respect your privacy. Oh, we have uh, already 28 participants. Okay. While other are coming. I am getting responses. And uh, also, may I ask people to put in your uh, educational level? So, are you on the bachelor program, on master program, on graduate program, etc.? Oh, you are already a scientist. Because I cannot guess it. And even if you show your faces, I couldn't guess it. Because uh, looking from my age, you are all equally young. Okay, now we are two minutes before the beginning. Oh, this, the audience is crowded. We have 34 people. I want to get even more. Hopefully. By the way, you probably have my email. If you have any questions, comments, advices, please don't hesitate to write. So I'll start in uh, one minute. Mm. People are still coming. Thank you. 
So I had two minutes to five minutes before I'll start. Okay, maybe I should start now. So, hello everybody. My name is Andre Losev. I'll put all informant, all important information on the board. Okay, so it means another thing. I am a mathematical physicist from Russia. Actually, you know, uh, just putting two letters is not enough to characterize me. In Europe, in all days, they used the following ring to show your direction in the sea. Actually, here it was not divided by two parts. It was divided but by three parts. So this is called north, north, east. And this is called north, east, east. So let me explain in the same way who I am. If you put here mathematics and physics, I am MMP, mathematical, mathematical physicist. Okay. Well, it is the first thing. Another thing, it's about uh, how I see the scientific communication. I accept the following model. So this is the head of a person. And the head of the person is made uh, similarly to modern computers. Namely, it has a processor and also it contains this N. And this N is just the neuron network. And we understand things using both of them. So here come definitions. And here come images, motivations, examples. When I mean explain, I mean to activate both parts of your brain to transfer the information of the concept. So concept should be first or second defined and then explained. By the way, in the Buddhist teaching, people use only this. So when you get the notion, you feel this, what's called satori. In English, it's understanding. So I'll try to achieve that you understand, what I try to achieve is that you understand 
what I'm trying to explain. Okay. And of course, I need your back reaction to see if you understand or what you do not understand, okay? So, as I wrote in advertisement to this course, the course would be Y-shaped. Here would be ideas from mathematics. I will use not all ideas, but mostly ideas from the super geometry and uh, a bit of algebraic geometry. Now, there is another line. It's called physics. So I actually consider uh, physics as the geometry to zero. Why it's geometry? Because, it, because geometry actually started as physics. People studied uh, our world and actually the shape of the earth. Geo means earth, metry is just to measure. But at some moment, revolution happened. A revolution in the attitude. People realized that instead of studying shapes, of Earth and also shapes of our world. People should study shapes as an abstract notion. And in this way, we have modern geometry. It's about shapes in general. It's about spaces. This motivation that I would say that is coming from physics is only the motivation to study abstract notion of space. And actually geometry now works about spaces. Now, What it has to do with physics? So physics starts with description of our world. And I will briefly explain main ideas about it. Especially because courses, physics are all bad. They are bad because uh, people are rethinking what happened. And that's why it's a complete mess with many mistakes. I mean, conceptual mistakes. Okay? So we will redo it a bit in order to get some ideas. And then the new subject appeared. It's called mathematical physics. It's about worlds.
somehow similar to our world. Like shapes, theory of shapes of spaces. It's about spaces somehow similar to our space. So the subject of mathematical physics is the study of these worlds. That's why it has two origins. First, origin from physics. Another, origin from mathematics, because mathematics are actually coming originally also from physics, but from the very simple physics. So when you count something, you use the notion of uh, an object that is uh, constant in time. That's why you can count. So you can count uh, coins because they exist. They are not disappearing. And they are not appearing from nothing. So it's about counting. Say nothing about geometry. However, in mathematics, this origin was mostly forgotten. And what people teach in classes are typically abstract mathematics. When you forgot the origin, how it appeared, okay? So quite surprisingly, today I'll speak a bit about mathematics, namely about categories and factors on the very elementary level. Next time, I'll start from the very different place. I'll start from physics. You see, this uh, graph is not a line. So unfortunately, we will have to study in the following way. A bit from here, a bit from here. Then we will meet. We will meet here. Okay. And if you know this shape with this meeting, okay, you under you will understand why I think that this is quite important. Okay. Now Let me give the ultimate defini the ultimate reason why category and functors are uh, that important in mathematical physics. And uh, I will summarize it in the following definition. Okay. Quantum field theory. Abstract. If not, you will read in the standard books. So mathematician Siegel gave a definition to it, that it is monoidal factor from <coughs> Geometrized cobordism to vector. 
vector spaces. So if you are a mathematical physicist, you should need to understand everything in this statement. So if you are a mathematician, of course you know what monoidal factor is. Maybe you never met cobordisms in your life. Maybe even if you met cobordisms, you never met geometrized cobordisms. But uh, if you are a mathematician, mostly you don't know how this guy is related to this guy. So if you know everything about this correspondence, you are a mathematical physicist. So let me show you some standard books. So typical book on quantum field theory is that thick. It contains some pictures and diagrams, but you will never see monoidal functors, cobordisms, et cetera, here. In order to see something about it, you should look at these two volumes. These two volumes is the quantum field and strings, a course for mathematicians, like 2,000 pages from Princeton. Maybe you know this book. Maybe not. It has interesting pictures showing mathematicians and physicists that are studying the same object. And this, so these pictures are made by Robert Digraph, who is now director of Princeton, and who is a mathematical physicist. So it's quite hard to read this book. And also, even in this volume from Princeton, you will not see this definition. So <clears throat> you are lucky to be on this course because here I'm going to explain this. So when I mean explain, I mean you will get some understanding of quantum field theory. So if you are a mathematician, and most of you are mathematicians, you would recall these monoidal functors, okay? But the main thing is not the concepts here and concepts here. The main thing is something that I forgot to write. And that is is. It is a relation between these two. Moreover, I would say that this definition is not quite complete. It has to be modified. And uh, people are working on this modification. And you will see what happens in this course. Okay. When I say quantum field theory, I will explain how people, how most of people are thinking about quantum field theory and why the way how they are thinking about quantum field theory is actually equivalent to this.
Now, people think that when you study quantum field theory, the main notion is age. Even if you never read it in your books, you get this feeling from society. So people are writing popular books called Under the Sign or of this age bar. Okay? However, in the definition I gave, there was no age bar. If you have monoidal factor, there is no place to put H bar in it. I would explain, of course, how H bar appears and what does it really mean. I know that these ideas sound controversial. If after these uh, talks, you will find in the corridor some physicist and ask him if what I am saying is correct. Sometimes his answer would be no. And mostly it is because due to, how I would say, great. So when I say great, I mean that Something is great. Great counter revolution. Made by the great man, Richard Feynman. And I'll explain this too. You see, typically we speak about great revolutions. I would like to speak about great counter-revolution. So actually, the reason of this counter-revolution is that in quantum world, classical physics disappears. Of course, I'll explain to you what the classical physics says. So basically, it's something that uh, you study at schools and uh, maybe somebody at university as the first two years. But what's important is that classical physics disappears in the strongly quantum world. And Feynman, who was a great man, and who had a great intuition about uh, classical physics, because what we see here, it's a classical physics, did not like the classical physics to disappear. And he put classical physics back inside quantum physics. Of course, it's quantum revolution. So what I'll try to explain to you in this course is not that we should go from the classical physics to quantum physics. It is a strange line because our world is quantum. It's our world. So classical physics is just the limit of our world. So what actually happens is, so this is called quantization. And this is called classization. So 
So I introduced this term. This is a standard term. So quantum physics sometimes is similar to classical physics. And H actually is distance between quantum physics of the theory and its classical limit. Okay? So it's one of the interpretations. Okay, so since a lot of you are mathematicians, according to, to the list, I will give you another explanation of this relation. Maybe you know that uh, there is standard geometry called commutative, and there is also non-commutative geometry. So according to the philosophy that uh, some of the mathematicians share, commutative geometry, actually super commutative, but you will see it later, is kind of the limit of uh, more general science called non-commutative geometry. We invented commutative geometry just because uh, it came from physics. The world around us seems to be commutative. So that's why commutativity is put in the, in the definition. However, some mathematicians think that actually we should start with the non-commutative geometry and consider commutativity just as a special case. Because uh, not only because in this limit many things become simpler, but also because uh, it is closer to our world or to the world of our thoughts, if you wish. Okay, and according to the so uh, I understand that uh, three hours is a long period of time. That's why I will do breaks. Okay, so in five minutes I will have the first break. So last five minutes of each uh, piece are for questions and remarks. So please do not hesitate. So please, any questions, remarks or whatever. So actually the reason why you came here to this session is that you have possibility to ask questions. Any kind of questions. So otherwise, the best strategy for you would be to look at the recording at your favorite at your favorite time with your favorite speed. Okay. So here you are to ask questions in real time. So I will do the following. I will wait until the brave person would start asking questions or making comments or something.
Okay, so uh, here I get the following questions. Ah, okay. So, okay, I start having questions. It's good. Okay. So, first question, where I can find the recorded video of these calls? Uh, so it will be on the on YouTube and also Professor San Hussein that it will be in China on this and that archive. Okay, then what's the reference book name? So uh, course in this way uh, was never written. So what I'm giving it's kind of the original course based on many ideas that circulate in society. Even if you open the books on string theory, you will not get this kind of explanation. Still, uh, it's a good point. When it will come to super geometry, I could recommend, uh, okay, I'll send some of my papers. So it's one thing. So you can read something about it. Then uh, I'm going to make notes. So you can read notes and you can also uh, see the recordings. So the first textbook, so it's my fault. I should show it uh, in another way. So this is a standard book called Introduction to Quantum Field Theory by Peskin and, Schro and Schroeder. Okay. So this book is actually written by P. P. M. Okay, PPM, not PMM, for physicists. And it's called Introduction to Quantum Field Theory. Then there, are, there is a, this book. And this book is quantum fields and strings. Mm, strings. And it's written that it is a course for mathematicians. 2,000 pages, two volumes. Still, not the way I see the stuff. But of course, you can have a look. So if you actually need, we will try to find uh, the standard textbooks for you not to see, no, not to study something from it, but you can study something from it. Uh, just to see what people used to think about that subject. Okay. So, uh, May I have any other questions, comments, remarks? I'll try to answer everything. So if uh, somebody doesn't know, my, I have an email. So that is. So you may ask questions there. Okay, so now it's a time 
for the five minutes break. So uh, maybe you will ask questions just after the five minutes break. Or put some emotions, you see. Okay, so uh, I'm not getting questions, maybe because you are afraid. So I want you to show my cat, because I know that Chinese people like cats, okay? So I actually showed you my cat, so you could not be afraid and uh, ask questions or uh, give commands. Or I forgot my glasses. So, by the way, I need uh, these uh, categories and functors not only to explain quantum field theory, but uh, also to explain what supergeometry is, because uh, I will uh, mostly rely on algebra geometric correspondence. That is a contravariant functor. Okay, so <clears throat> still I need to have contact with the audience. So may I ask you, I mean people from the audience, to say who knows what is contravariant functor? I actually need your response. Okay. Sorry. I, I okay. said I'm familiar with the concept. Okay. Very good. So, who else? So, please say yes or no. Nobody would punish you if you say, or oh. somebody doesn't know. Oh, very good. Somebody doesn't know it. Oh, very good. Okay. Okay. So some people don't know, uh, some people know, and uh, others are afraid, I don't know of what, that their professors would uh, have a look and see that they don't know it. Okay, still I need to talk about it a bit. So, so if you if you know it, it is still uh, useful for you to hear how I'll explain it, because in this way probably you would not get more information about contravariant factor, but actually you will get some information about me. Because uh, my mind exists in my way or exhibits itself in my way of explanation of contravariant factor. So 
if you know what contravariant functor is, you should still know who I am. Okay? And uh, when I will try to explain something else, I'll explain it in the same style how I am explaining contravariant functor. Okay? So, so before I'll explain contravariant functor or actually functors, I'd like to explain a bit of category theory. Very beginning, because it seems to be a language. So before category theory, there was so-called set theory. Actually, <coughs> this notion, notion of set theory is very European. So the difference between West and the East is that in the West, people are very, very individualistic. And uh, when you say about something, you prefer to decompose it on pieces, on elements. In the East, uh, people uh, are wiser and they understand that the group of people is not just collection of people that the main thing are relations among them. But set theory appeared in the West as a collection of elements. And people started describing mathematics in this way. And uh, say the first failure came when people wrote the axioms for the group. So great mathematician, Boris Fagin, used to criticize someone's description of the subject, saying that uh, your uh, axioms are as non-natural as the standard axioms of the group. Actually, if you think about the group as a collection of elements, you say that there is some strange operation called multiplication. So what does it mean to multiply two pencils? Something strange. Strange operation. And uh, strange axiom. It's called associativity. Very strange. And then you start to think about inverse elements. So since multiplication operation for elements is strange, this notion is also very strange. So suppose you have a pencil. What is inverse of a pencil? Huh? If you came from physics, you know that inverse uh, you know that inverse of a pencil is uh, empty pencil. If you put them together, a thing would blow up and you'll have nothing. Okay, but it's kind of axiom for addition. And here, this thing doesn't look like addition because in most of examples, it is not commutative. So this set of axioms is very strange. And the reason 
is that set theory is the improper language to, ex to write down things, to explain things. Because it's about objects that are, that are nouns, okay? They would become better if we describe the notion of category. So I'll, exp I'll explain the notion of category, and immediately you would see that uh, this mysterious set of axioms of the group would become much better motivated. So category consists of so-called objects and morphisms. So, how one can think about objects? Ah, there is a question. Is Russia east or west? Russia is in the middle. That's why we can appreciate ideas from both east and west. Okay? So we are, we are doing our best. Okay, so objects. So this is very good object. Also, this box with pencils and the lamp is also an object. So, What I can do with the object? I can say rotate it. So I can also put it in a box. So that's why morphisms should be considered from the point of our neural network, something like evolution. of objects. So, now I am coming to the naturalness of the notion of Composition of morphisms. So it is hard to make composition of objects. At least it's absolutely impossible to make non commutative composition of objects. Say that object A is composed with object B is not like if you do it in the other way. However, morphisms can be composed. So the simplest example, I take the pencil, I can rotate it, and I can rotate it again. If I do these rotations twice, It is also an evolution. So it's very natural to compose it. So morphisms are composed this way as evolution. So I told you that uh, all mathematical concepts uh, have their origin in our world. Okay. Now, What if you consider evolution 
3. You clearly have these three evolutions. And just you can see that I can consider this thing first, and this, and this, and this thing then. Okay? And in this sense, it's quite natural. To think that the composition of morphisms is associated. So, if I have morphism one, and if I have morphism two, I define composition. So we write it in this way. So it's composition of composition of morphisms. So it's a map from the pair where we have two morphisms, and then we get another morphism. And this is the notion of associative. Okay, so I started with evolutions, with evolution of uh, a pencil. Now, I can make another experiment. Namely, the process is putting a pencil in a box. And then I put this box in the larger box. Definitely, it's a composition. If I put it in the even larger box, it would be it would be the diagram where I uh, definitely have associativity. So it is an example. Of situation where I have sets, and I have one set that is inside another set that is inside the third set. The way how first set is inside the second set, and the second set is inside the third set, gives me the explanation how first set is inside the third set. So this may be considered as morphism. And this may be considered as a composition. So actually, morphism again is an action, putting one inside another. And this is a diagram of associativity. So from, from this way, from this picture, I am coming to another picture. So one object A is transformed into the object B by the morphism M1. And then it is transformed in the object C by the morphism M2. And I have compositions. You see, here compositions exist because there is an action in time. However, 
I could be, I could be even more clever. Consider once again, I'm coming from from our intuition in the world. Consider an earth. Consider the continent. Consider three cities. There is a road here, and there is a road here. If I have a road from the city A to city B, and I have a road from the city B to city C, I can compose them and get a road from city A to city C. And it is clear, it is evident that composition is, composition of roads is uh, associated. So what I am trying to achieve? I am trying to explain to you what is, so why notion of composition of morphisms and associativity looks natural. So when you think about the composition of roads, you may think that there is no notion of time. Actually, there is a notion of time because when you have a road, you can walk along it. So walk, so the road is the way how you go from one place to another place. And here you have composition of roads as composition of walks. However, you may say that uh, people could walk, could walk at different speed, but still they take the same path. And we will come to this issue right now. Because from what I told you, you should get an impression that everything is associated. Now, I want to give you a counterexample. I will come back to this example with uh, cities and roads. There are two kinds of morphisms that I can introduce. One kind of morphism is walk that takes any time. So we consider walks in one hour, in two hours, in half an hour, and all of them are morphisms. These type of morphisms have a subscript T. That is the time of the walk. Now, we can define another set of morphisms. So let us call it walk in one hour. So suppose you again have Okay, not cities, let's say villages, A, B, C, D. And uh, you consider walks that take one hour. The question is, could we compose two such walks? 
So the first answer would be, so what do you think? Could we compose two such works? Who has an idea? Could we compose two such works? So now the space of morphisms is work that takes one hour. So I actually think that I, uh, no, good. Thank you, Tim. But, but what can we do? Actually, we can say, look, guy, I'm constructing a theory here. So you see, I'm constructing a theory and somebody is working. I could tell him, look, Take your walk that takes one hour and move, please, and please move twice faster. And everything else would be the same. Or I can make a movie of a guy walking and I can uh, turn on speed of his walk. I will, I will play it back in the double speed. So in this way, the person who goes from A to B in one hour now would go it in half hour. And then I'm taking this half hour box and compose them. Hmm? Okay, so it means that I'm not uh, working with real world, but with a movie made out of it. But still I can have a composition. So I take a movie of a person going from A to B in one hour. I play it with a double speed. And the same I'm doing with a person who walks from B to C in one hour. I play it with a double speed. Speed, I glue these two movies. And I have a walk from A to C, where here there are double speeds. OK? I made a, I made a composition. And this is almost natural, hmm? isn't it? Now the question, so I can do this again. So the question to the audience, would this composition be associated? So I actually want you to vote. So I am not asking the person with the faster speed. Maybe he would not like to do it. I'll take a movie and uh, I'll compress it. So would it be associative or not? I mean, that's com this composition. Very good team, very good, exactly. This composition would not be associative because of different speeds. So here, if I compose A, B, and B, C, the speeds, the speed would be, if I first compose A and B and B, C, here the speed would be four, here the speed would be four, and here the speed would be two. If I do it in another way, here the speed would be two, here the speed would be four, here the speed would be four. Okay. So let me summarize what I explained to you. I explained to you that in many cases, composition of evolutions is associated. However, it is possible to 
in when some cases when it is not associated. By the way, it would be it is possible to to correct this thing by introducing so-called reparameterization of the movie. You see, and it means that things could be. It's a time for me to quote great John Bias. So here I'm coming to side remark. That is due to John Bias. Statement A equals to B is either trivial or wrong. So people who study philosophy instead of mathematics would like this. And let me explain how John Bice thinks about it. He says, suppose B, say an object or something, is exactly A. Then this statement is trivial. Now suppose B is not exactly A. Then this statement is wrong. So the question is why we are using why we are using this equation sign? And the answer that is given by John Bias is that this is just short notation for A equivalent to B with respect to the equivalence relation gamma. Here I'm making a pause. You probably need some time to evaluate this idea. That here we have three ingredients, not two. A, B, and equivalence relation. So let me come to my example. If I identify people moving with different speeds, I will get associativity. If I will not, I will get a difference. So I'm thinking about very basic concepts. They look very simple, but you need some time to evaluate it. Because mostly, I don't know what kind of teachers did you have, because I don't know you. Actually, I don't even see you. You see, would uh, you show your faces? faces. I could see something in your eyes. By the way, do you know that here we have in our face, we have like 60 muscles. Hmm? Do you know why do we have muscles here? 
So uh, nature is very economic. It would not bring our muscles to our face if we don't need it in our, in our life. Because uh, you need to grow them up, you, know, you need to feed them. Why? We have 60 muscles in our face. It's because we all have the first language. It's called mimics. So when you show up your face, I can try to read what you are telling me by your face. So when you switch off your face, I have no back reaction. So that's why, by the way, teaching by Zoom is bad not because uh, of computers or electronics or whatever. It is because in this teaching, the first language is switched off. So in real teaching, a professor can see faces and get back reaction. He can see who understands, who is not understanding. This is a wave of the audience talking to professor and not interfering to each other. You see? If everybody would speak, there will be a noise and uh, nobody could hear, the, hear anything. However, due to the first language that's called mimics that comes from your face, it's possible to teach, okay? Okay, still, uh, if you don't want to speak, even if you don't want to speak with your face, you may not uh, show up, but, uh, but the price for it, would be lower the quality of what I am uh, trying to tell you. Because I will, I will tell things in the wrong speed, okay? So I would run when I have to go slower, okay? Or I'll go slow when I have to walk faster. So it means that the speed of my talk would be say like this, while it's more proper to do it like this. So, so the result would be different. By the way, please know that showing your, your face, you are helping not only to you, you are helping to other people. Because all comments, positive, negative, serve improving the quality of the talk, okay? Okay, still, thank you. So I think you, your name is second. So uh, Mr. Who for showing up. Thank you, team. Okay. So I spoke a bit about associativity, why it is natural, and uh, why, uh, in some cases, you get something non-associated. So you rarely have something non-associated. It's the reason why uh, people mostly are not studying non-associative objects, or actually they start objects that are associative up to some equivalence relation, and it leads to the notion for expert of A infinity category. So this thing happens if you consider uh, cases like this. By the way, just to give you impression, these are not only paths between towns, these are also strings connecting different objects that are called D-brains. The same science. And that's why, now for experts, you are getting an infinity category in string theory. Okay. 
now what would be if I called morphisms elements? I will get and the now so I'll call morphisms elements and now I will consider only morphisms from A to A. So I have a box from A to A, and I can naturally compose them. And this composition is associated. And also I can have a trivial walk. So what is a trivial walk? Trivial walk is nothing happens. It's also a walk from a state to itself. So when I keep this pencil without any rotation, it's also an evolution. So here I have identity walk and also walks with associative product. And this is called semi group. So would somebody teach you group theory? He should start with categories, then morphisms from the object to itself, associativity, triviality, and this is a semi group. Now, how to get a group? In my uh, picture of walks, you just need to, to play the same recording from the end to beginning. You should just invert time. OK? So M to M minus one is the inversion of time. So sometimes it is natural. Like if you have rotation, you can invert rotation. However, if you walk and if you play the movie from the end to the beginning, you will see something non-natural. So it may happen that there are inversions or there are no inversions. So people actually first invented the notion of group because they looked at rotations or uh, changing the order of, of objects and the sets. Something like that. Actually, the notion group was invented by Galois, basically, when he was observing the, the way how uh, roots are changing. Okay, so if there is an inversion, you will say not semi group, we say group. Okay, that's how group axioms appear. And when you say group, you should probably keep in mind something like rotations of the pencil. Okay. So that's how I explained to you naturalness of the axiom of uh, axioms of category and uh, why associativity is natural and uh, why is the group 
is a particular case of category. Okay, so it is the end of the second part of my talk. And still I want to hear on C questions. Okay, sorry. So Miss Who, not Mr. Who. I have two Who's, okay. You see, and it's my fault. I should have a big screen and I have a small screen. That's why I see you only partially, but still, thank you for participation. Still, I want to hear or to read questions before we go to the second break. or comments. It may be not questions. It could be a comment like, sorry, what you are talking about is nonsense, or sorry, what you are talking about is trivial. We studied it during the first year in the university because the uh, Chinese educational system is uh, much better than uh, Russian and people study categories at the very beginning. So there was a question, do we have physics on Thursday or mathematics on Thursday? So I would prefer to interchange. So, so I started the Thursday. So mathematics, so physics would be on Tuesday. Well, still it's, it, it's a good question. So, so what I am explaining here, I consider intuition of mathematics. What is behind it? It's kind of an explanation why uh, you never uh, have a books on uh, non-associative algebras. Okay. So good question. Is M stand for move? So let me think. So what is morphism? A morphism came from ancient culture and uh, a and actually it's something about changing. And uh, mostly. So uh, I would of course prefer to call things not morphisms, but moves to make it simpler. But uh, okay, it's a good remark that uh, we should replace the strange name morphism by simple main name moves. Okay, what's your favorite category theory textbook? Uh, at this level of understanding, you do not need category theory textbook. because I'm telling you some basics, okay? So, uh, so when people uh, study categories, uh, they uh, studied a lot of different constructions there. So I am not going to use them. I'll try to introduce, okay. Okay. How can we reflect the physical properties of such objects like D-brains or maybe gauge fields? 
a description in terms of category theory. So I told it, but uh, important things should be told several times. So in the fashionable string theory, you have objects and you have strings. So string is coming from object to object. When we consider time, strings join and come together. And this is the composition of morphisms. However, as, we, as I will explain in the course, the actual process in string theory is not category, but actually a infinity category. So this infinity means that you have more complicated structure than composition of morphisms. And I can illustrate it in the picture. No, I cannot because of the pencil. Oh. No, this would go up. No, it is better. It's good if it goes this way. So here, the, here we have two strings. Connecting objects one, two, three, four, five, and six. These objects evolve in time. So object one and object C and object six evolve up to infinity. Objects two and three got annihilated here. The same happens with objects four and five. So strings connecting object one and object two and strings connecting object, object three, that is actually NT2, are joined at this place and then continue their evolution. And then another string comes it's evolution of the string between five and six. So actually what we have here is kind of the higher composition. We have three morphisms. They are somehow composed into one morphism. And it is the, the origin why people say A infinity. It means that together with the composition of morphisms, there is also higher composition of morphisms that people study here. So when I talk about homological algebra, you will see why this composition, why this structure, namely A infinity category is natural. I just mentioned it uh, when I said that uh, Associativity could be up to something. This up to something uh, is expressed in sense of algebraic topology that the associativity holds up to something exact. And it leads to this subject of A, of, of a infinity category. However, when I wrote this picture, I will give you a physical explanation, explanation from physics how people were thinking about it, about this higher composition. Let one, two, three, four, five, six be something like quarks. So this is a quark, this is an antiquark. This is another quark. 
and here we have, have another antiquarks. Okay, I can call them. The, let this be antiquark one, quark two, antiquark two, quark three, antiquark three, and quark four. So people had these diagrams from the beginning of 70s and physics. If you have a quark and antiquark, and if you have so-called QCD string, it is called a meson. It is another meson. And this is the third meson. When two mesons come together, quarks annihilate, and you get the third meson out of two. Then another meson comes. Quark and this meson and antiquark and this meson also annihilate. So you have this interesting diagram that corresponds to Feynman diagram of the following type. I would say meson mi one, mi two, mi three. So it's uh, what happens with the meson. So actually, you don't see this uh, in the real physical experiments that three mesons group into one. What mostly happen in physical experiments is what will happen if I revert it in time. One, two, three. So that's what actually happens. I have two methods. They have a common quark. So one quark in one method, another antiquark in another method. They annihilate here. So we have intermediate method. And then this intermediate method decouples into two other methods. So we have the following Feynman diagram. Mi one, mi two, mi four, mi three. So that's how physicists see these higher compositions. For them, they are not something unnatural. For them, these higher compositions is something that they measure in accelerator experiments. We have a beam of first meson. We have a beam of the second meson. Boom, they collide. We have uh, two other mesons. And you can measure it. So this is a Feynman diagram. By the way, it's a diagram invented by the same man who made great contra-revolution. Of course, we will talk about it. Here we have this Feynman diagram written in terms of what is called QCD strings. So this final diagram is nothing but the higher operations. So mesons here are just like morphisms. Because QCD string is just like a path that connects one quark with another quark. So it is very important to understand this picture if you would like to think about A infinity Fukaya category, if you are a mathematician. So if you are a mathematician, you should think about this important notion in homological verosymmetry. If you are a physicist, 
you should think about this and this because it's about scattering amplitudes. So these two scattering amplitudes and infinity categories are the same in sense that they are representations of the same structure, just different representations. You see, here it's like in the relation between algebra and geometry. Suppose you are Galois and you want to study the question of solving uh, polynomial equations and radicals. So you are thinking about permutation of roots of the polynomial. Okay, suppose at the same time you are physicist, uh, sorry, you are geometry, and you are thinking about rotations. You study different subjects in mathematics. However, you are coming to the same concept. So the concept of A infinity category is uh, as important as the concept of group. I just I, I was just trying to explain to you how group appears from category. Okay. So uh, you will hear more about it later in the course. Okay, can we associate a Wilson loop? Yes, we do. So it's a question. Okay. So it is possible to associate a Wilson line from the beginning. It, may, it means here is a quark. Maybe you know that quarks are charged with respect to electromagnetic field. So if you consider this process in the presence of uh, electromagnetic field, you need to put here the Wilson line. But you asked about exactly Wilson loop. So Wilson loop is actually an observable in the gauge theory. And uh, actually, the same diagram could be considered not only in the theory of mesons, but also in the theory of gauge fields. OK? So you should not be surprised that the same notion and even the same picture appear in different theories. So in the gauge theory, we should forget about quarks. In the gauge theory, we should think about W bosons and Z bosons. So, and what I wrote here is the interpretation of W bosons and Z bosons and Z bosons in terms of strings. Okay, so you don't have any quarks. You have the space feeling D brains and W boson is exactly the open string connecting them. So before we have QCD string, and now it is an open string connecting them. So string has a tension. So the minimal tension is a straight line. Still, it has some energy because you, because it's not a point. So the energy of this, or because you stretch it, the energy of the stretch string is the mass of the W boson. Okay. So, so here let me go a bit away from the real world. So if I, if I consider three D brains, I would have here also W boson. So. 
fundamental strings connecting D brains are W bosons. And they have masses. And here you have a scattering diagram. Okay. So now <clears throat> you are talking about Wilson loop. So this theory, now this theory turns out to be the gauge theory in the so-called the Coulomb phase. And we will talk about it too. So it is possible to have an observable. So electromagnetic field that is massless comes from strings that start and end of the, on the same D brain. You see the minimal size of such string. Okay, so they are called photons. The minimal size of such uh, string is zero. That's why these photons are massless. So you have massless electrodynamics coupled to these W bosons. So in this massless electrodynamics, you have a field. So if you have a line L, you can couple this field to this line. So it is an observable in uh, this theory. So this is Wilson loop. It is observable. It means that you can put a the theory such that you can see such phenomena. So uh, I answer to it like uh, in text declaration uh, of United States. When you are paying taxes, you are not saying very good that you included all your income. You are saying that uh, you include all your income to the best of my knowledge, okay? That's why here I'm not saying it's true. It's true to the best of my knowledge. Okay, you are welcome. So now we inevitably should have a break. So this break should be 10 minutes break, okay?